Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive director of the Rackley Fellowship Program at Harvard University. Today's presentation is by our Helen Panam Fellow, Jin Yi Jessica Lee. Jessica is a leader in the field of computational biology, developing mathematical analysis tools to explore biological questions. Jessica leads the Junction and Statistics of Statistics and Biology Research Group at UCLA. One of Jessica ma Jessica's major research endeavors have been to study the central dogma of gene expression, the process through which DNA is used to reproduce life. In collaboration with other researchers, she developed a statistical method to re-examine the data of existing study on the steps of the central dogma. The resulting models help to reduce experimental errors in all studies related to the process of gene expression. In her time at UCLA, Jessica has overseen multiple other research projects, bolstering new collaboration between statistics and biology. Her current focus is to enhance the statistical rigor and transparency in analyzing the complex genomics data generated by cutting edge biotechnologies, hoping to improve the reproducibility of scientific discoveries. At Radcliffe, Jessica is writing a book to dispel common misconception in genomics data analysis. She plans to do that by connecting cutting edge genomics research questions with fundamental statistic and machine learning methods. Specifically, she will focus on distinctions and choices biological scientists make among methods that are apparently similar but fundamentally different, so that quantitative genomics researchers will have a clear guidelines to follow in their development of bioinformatics tools. In her leisure time, Jessica loves singing. She loves Chinese opera and rhythm and blues music. She thinks that these two genres can come together beautifully, much like statistics and biology do. I am delighted to welcome Jessica to the podium. Thank you so much, Claudia, for the very nice introduction. It's my great honor to be a fellow at Radcliffe Institute and also to give this public talk. So my talk today will be about my research journey, how I arrived at the junction of statistics and biology. So I want to open my talk by first giving a suspense, looking at the symbol or the logo on the bottom left corner. It's the logo I use for my group. So there are colors mixed, but we'll see why this makes sense. So first of all, I will do a special introduction, which I have never done for my past talks. We'll see. So why would I use this as an intro? So there are several reasons which I will elaborate later. But one thing I want to mention is that the singer, Li Hong Wang, who was my favorite singer, and I listened to the song in my college years, and Li Hong was born and grew up in the US, but he developed his music career in China, which is kind of opposite to my career development. That's one connection. But we will see next. So I will show this bridge in the song, which is Chinese opera. So Chinese opera has been in China for almost 1,000 years. But specifically, this type of opera is called Peking opera. It became popular in early 20th century. And then, since then, has become the so-called national theater of China. So this bridge uses Chinese opera and the instruments. So next, let's listen to the verse of this song. So this verse is in the style called Rhythm and Blues, short as R&B. So I would say this song is a Chinese pop music, 
So people cut in short as C pop, and this R&B is the major part of it. And R&B is actually popular music, typically including elements of blues of, and African American folk music, and marked by a strong beat and simple chord structure. Since then, R&B has become popular, I think, for over 60 years, and it's Western music, right? Not Chinese music. Then what happens in, later in this song, in the chorus part, is that the Chinese opera and R&B will be mixed. So what is similar between Chinese opera and R&B? It's this music thing called melisma. So it means that we sing one syllable, but the syllable extends to a group of notes. So we have Listen to this, we have heard this in both R&B and Chinese opera, specific in this song, like the, 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 the melody we just heard, Ching, means this, right? It's just one syllable, but it travels several, several notes. So why would I say this, and what's the connection between music and songs? Because I'm a scientist. So first of all, I want to say Chinese opera, as a mu music genre, is a very specialized and small field, right? Not so many musicians are still working on Chinese opera. In contrast, R&B is popular. It's a very diverse and bigger field. So analogous to my research in science, we, I want to say that statistics is known to be specialized and a smaller field than biology. Biology is more diverse because it can, you can have many different angles to study biology, not necessarily one skill. For example, nowadays people majoring in engineering, mathematics, chemistry, physics, may all find their unique angles to study biological questions. So that's the contrast between statistics and biology. So I want to say that for musicians, Maybe mixing Chinese opera and R&B is something interesting. For scientists, mixing statistics and biology can also be interesting. If we just do a simple addition, first one, statistics, plus one, biology. If we simply mix them, this is the color we get, right? The, the green color in the bottom. But what I wanna achieve is not simple addition but synergy. I want to be one plus one greater than two, and that's the junction, the purple part. So I started my journey as a biology major student in 2003 in Tsinghua University in Beijing. This is the map. And why would I wanna be majoring in biology? A major reason was this exciting human genome project which started in 1990 and completed right before I entered college, 2003. So this is a roadmap of human genome project, but we don't need to worry about the details in this figure. We just want to see that it was a tremendous effort led by multinationals, nations. So basically, before this project, we never knew what our human genome sequence is like. And this is the first ever time we can read out our human genome. So what, is, what do we mean by genome sequence? So if we look at this figure, so our genetic information is stored in something called DNA. And DNA has four letters, A, T, C, and G. The sequence is the information. So our DNA are stored in those long strands as sequences. One particular thing is that DNA has two strands intertwined. So A is paired with T, C is paired with G. So these are called base pairs. So coming back here, the BP means base pair. So Human Genome Project basically read out this sequence. So whether A is followed by T, followed by C, followed by G, and etc. So we hope that knowing the sequence would allow us to uncover the genetic mystery. Hopefully we can use the sequence to understand why we are different, why we have certain disease, and how we can possibly cure the disease.
So 2003 is a prime time for studying biology because it's no longer the macro scale classification of plants and animals, but we can go to the molecules. It becomes molecular biology. And the fundamental concepts of molecular biology and genetics are genes and genome. What is a gene? So knowing what is a DNA, a gene is a region of DNA that encodes some function. Like the red part here is a gene. And our human genome has about 20,000 genes that can encode proteins. Why does this matter? Because proteins are key players in our cells, which I will talk about. So knowing which genes code which proteins is important. But besides the genes, our genome is much bigger. Our genome means the collection of DNAs. So this whole DNA sequence is called a genome, right? So genes are only a small proportion of the genome, only 1%. So to understand how genes function, the fundamental principle is called the central dogma. It describes how information flows from DNA to RNA and then to protein. So there are two key steps. From DNA to RNA, it's called transcription. From RNA to protein, it's called translation. So RNA is similar to DNA because it also has four letters. The only difference is that T becomes U in RNA, and also RNA is only single-stranded. It doesn't have two strands. But protein is something totally different. It's, it has 20 amino acids. So why do we need to care about proteins and RNAs? A simple example to explain the importance is that in each human being, the DNA is the same in all cells. No matter it's a muscle cell or a fat cell, the DNA is the same within an individual. But the cells are very different. We know that. Then what explains the differences of the cells? If we look at the genes RNA levels, like how many RNA, sorry, RNA and protein levels, like how many RNAs and proteins are from each gene. We see very big differences from muscle cells to fat cells to bone cells. So here, RNA and protein levels are meaningful. So if we can measure their levels, we can better understand how the genetic information can convert a stem cell into a muscle cell or a fat cell. But can we measure protein levels for all genes in an easy way? That's the first question. If so, we'll be happy. And protein. So there is a technology called mass spectrometry. It can allow us to measure all the proteins in a biological sample, say a blood draw. If we get a blood, this technology allows us to measure proteins. So it's a complicated procedure, as you can see in this diagram. Basically, we need to chop this protein into fragments and use this mass spectrometry to, to, to measure the weight of each fragment and then convert the weight back to amino acid sequence so we know which protein the fragments are from. So by saying proteomics, this term, this jargon, means that it's the collection of all proteins. So in my talk, you will see this word omics again and again. Proteomics, proteomics means the omics of proteins. So this looks very cool. However, the reality is not that ideal. The experiment is very expensive, and it's, it has low sensitivity. What it means is that if a protein doesn't appear often in the sample, if its copy number or the number of proteins is small, it will be missed by this technology. So you can only measure the proteins that are a lot, but not the rare proteins. So uh, compromise is that to measure RNA, because we believe that in the central dogma, if a gene has a lot of proteins, then the gene should have a lot of RNAs. That's the common belief. And let's just remember this for now, because I will revisit this topic again. So then how about measuring RNAs? Luckily, we have much better ways to measure all genes' RNA levels. So in my college years, this technology called microarrays has already become popular. So looking at this chip, what this means? 
Every spot here is designed to measure one gene. To design the spot, what you need to know is the gene's DNA sequence. If you have that information, then you can design something called a probe, which is similar to like how you try to do fishing. You use the probe to fish the gene. You put the gene's specific probe in the spot, and then if the gene's RNAs are there, the, probe, the spot will light up. So basically the color here or the brightness here would indicate a gene's expression level. So by reading out these colors, we can know, oh, some genes have more RNAs than other genes. That gives us the information. But one thing I have to note is that this data is noisy because some genes' RNA can naturally be bound tighter to the probes, so the colors will be brighter. So that means even if two genes may have the same number of RNAs, the colors may be different. How can we adjust for such bias? That is an important question. So basically, how to analyze such microarray data to convert those color signals to numbers so we can do some calculation is not as straightforward as one might think. Especially, we cannot just look at each spot one by one by eyeballing. We have to use computation. And we need statistics. So trying to be able to analyze such data in the later years of my college I decided to pursue a quantitative major in my PhD so I can have the skills to do the data analysis. So I went to UC Berkeley for my PhD. So I came from China to the US to pursue my study. What is statistics? I often got this question when I took Uber or Lyft. The driver asked me, what do I do? I said, oh, I'm a statistician or I'm a statistics professor. Then the answer I often got was, is it accounting? Right? So the confusion is always there because statistics itself is a jargon. It's not a common word. So what does it mean? The Wikipedia definition says, statistics is the discipline that concerns the collection, organization, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. So the key word is data. However, this is very different from many people's intuition or thought. The right Blackboard is many people's impression. A lot of math formula. Why was that? The reason was because in the emergence of statistics, right back into the 19th, 20th century, when statistics was just developed, people had to use a lot of math. Remember at that time, we didn't even have a calculator. Every calculation had to be done by hand. If you have some numbers, like the measurements, right? If you measure some plants, heights, how do you analyze those data? You only have a paper and pen. Then you need, you need it to use math to help you simplify a lot of things so you could possibly do the calculation. So back then, math was essential. And also, statistics concerns about some noise, uncertainty in the data. To be able to formally consider the noise. How do we account for noise? There is a mathematical tool called probability theory, which provides a tool for statistics. And we have heard of that from Melanie's talk before. So back then, 100 years ago, statistics is very math heavy, as opposed to looking at actual data. But now it's different. 21st century, we have powerful computers. And statistics has evoluted into a core of data science. So now data plays a much bigger role. And I want to say that it becomes a bigger field and it should be more diverse because we should welcome people with all sorts of skills. Math skills for sure, but computing skills are also important, right? We want to use effective ways to get valuable information from data. That's the key of statistics. So, when I was a student, PhD student, I meaning my PhD years, I was fortunate to be part of this so-called ENCODE project. It's an international project. The full name is called Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. It started in 2004, and in 2007, before I started my PhD, it just completed the pilot phase. 
which is about 1% of the genome, which are protein coding genes, the genes we've talked about, like 20,000 genes that code proteins. So due to those new data generation, because the ENCODE wants to understand our DNA sequence, what, what do, why do I need that? Because knowing the human DNA sequence is only the first step. Since genes are 1% of the genome, we want to know what are the 99% for? What are their functions? Why our DNA has so many unused information? Are they used really junk DNA or they have functions? So ENCODE was trying to answer that question. And you could imagine, a lot of data was generated, right? So therefore, there is a field or such subject called bioinformatics. It's a combination of two words, biology and informatics. Bioinformatics has been a field for almost more than 20 years because since we have genomic data measured, we need to use informatics to analyze the data. I want to say that within bioinformatics, if we really want to understand data, we need statistics. Statistics plays a crucial role. So when I was a PhD, my advisors Professors Peter Bickel and Haiyan Huang led this statistician team within the ENCODE, and we were very fortunate to be the first statisticians to analyze those data. And this is the Berkeley News, which reported what we did back in 2012, before I finished my PhD. And I just mentioned the statistics part. Similar to the Chinese opera I showed in the beginning, The Bridge. So now, I want to talk about something similar or analogous to the verse part, RNB part. So I'm talking about biotechnologies. So biotechnologies are the key drivers of biological discoveries. This is what ENCODE used back in 2004, the technologies ENCODE used trying to understand the genome functions. So I will focus on this gene and it's mRNA, transcribed from gene. So because RNA is transcribed from gene through the process called transcription, each RNA can be called a transcript. So to measure these RNAs, microarray is used, right? This is a technology I mentioned already. Besides microarray, ENCO uses other technologies to measure other aspects of the DNA, such as which parts of the DNA are naked, they are not wrapped around proteins, which parts of DNA has chemical modifications, right? So these are the things ENCO trying to measure. But you don't need to worry about the jargons. You can just have an impression on the terms here because you will see they will quickly be changed. This is 2004. And 2008 has a very big breakthrough, which is the beginning of my PhD year. This technology called next generation sequencing applied to measure RNAs. It's called RNA sequencing or short as RNA-seq. It became popular because it can do something microarray couldn't do. Because I said to do microarray, you need to know the gene sequence, right? DNA sequence to design the probe to capture the RNA. But RNA-seq doesn't require you to know the sequence. You just use the machine to measure whatever RNA is in your biological sample without prior knowledge. So that gives you much bigger power to measure unknowns. That's why it's popular. So looking at this diagram, we can ignore the details. We just need to know, oh, given a biological sample, say blood draw, we try to extract the RNA molecules. Then we go through some experimental procedure to prepare the sample for sequencing machine. We will load it to a sequencing machine, and we will read out the RNA sequence. That will be the data. And we want to analyze the data to convert it to how many copies of RNA each gene has. So that will be another computation step. But basically, this data is massive, and it can give us new information compared to microarray. So now, ENCO 2013, that's the year I completed my PhD. If you remember the terms in the 2004 figure, you can see that here the technologies have largely changed. New terms, new technologies in 10 years. And for example, to measure a gene's RNAs or transcripts, the technology becomes RNA-seq. 
instead of microarray. So new technologies will revolutionize biology and give us new discoveries. So this is what the ENCO data looks now. After how many years? 17, 18 years of efforts. We have data for these many human organs and measuring different aspects of our genome. And this is the number of experiments that have been done. So these are the massive data deposited, available in public databases. They are waiting for people to analyze them, to extract new information. Besides ENCODE, or besides the technologies I mentioned, I also want to say that after I finish my PhD, there are newer technologies that give us more information. So the technologies I mentioned previously are called bulk, meaning that we get a tissue sample, we measure everything in the tissue. We lose the cell information because the cells are smashed, right? Just like smoothie. You mix all cells together, the genetic materials RNA together. But the newer single cell technology, which appeared in 2009 and became mature after 2014, 15, can allow us to keep individual cells. So after we do the measurements, we will know, oh, this is the gene expression in this cell, in another cell. We have better resolution. Furthermore, um, like four or five years later, people have develop the spatial technology, which give us even more information. We can know the cells' locations. So we keep individual cells, but also their locations, so we know which cell is neighbor of which cell. And that information is also valuable, because we can potentially know how cells communicate each other and influence each other, just like in this fellowship program. So I want to say that these technologies give me a very big chance to do my research. I joined UCLA in 2013, and I stayed there until now. So my group is called the Junction of Statistics and Biology. So these are some keywords from Google Trends, big data, next generation sequencing, I mentioned this technology already, precision medicine. So big data is a common term you can see in the news, right? We have a lot of data to analyze, and I, I, I color it as statistics because it's mostly a data analytical term. Next generation sequencing is colored as the biology color because it's about biotechnology. Finally, we want to apply statistics to analyze next generation sequencing data, and the hope is that we can do precision medicine. That's the ultimate goal. If we can use each person's genomics data, extract valuable information to design the most appropriate treatment, that's precision medicine, and that's the ultimate goal of biotechnology. So I want to share a story of my research after this to, to demonstrate how statistics can help understanding biology. So this is a quote I want to use because I think it's very enlightening. It's, it, the quote is from a famous statistician, Dr. John Tukey. The best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. So then I'm going to show you how I can play in the biologist's backyard. And just as a um, review, right, I mentioned statistics analogous to Chinese opera, biotechnology analogous to r and Now I'm going to show you the chorus, how they mix together. So the story is how I can quantify the central dogma, which I already introduced. So central dogma has been known for 60 years, but mostly as a qualitative principle. DNA goes to RNA through transcription. RNA goes to protein through translation. But the quantitative information flow, how many RNAs are from the DNA, how many proteins are from the RNA, that quantitative information remains unknown for many, many years because we don't have the technology to do the measurements. Besides these two steps, we must also know that mRNAs will be degraded, proteins will be degraded. So those two degradation steps will also affect how many proteins we have in the cell, right? So four steps work together. But luckily, those biotechnologies I mentioned allow us to quantify the central dogma. So for the mRNAs, 
I mentioned microarray and RNA sequencing, next generation sequencing. They can measure each gene's mRNA level. Mass spectrometry, though expensive, it's available, can measure protein level. And these two degradation steps can be measured by another technology. So, Using those technologies, this 2011 Nature paper made a very shocking claim. RNA levels do not well predict protein levels, which means that coming back to the central dogma, knowing mRNA levels tell you very little information about protein levels. Remember that I said people believed mRNA levels and protein levels are highly correlated, so if we cannot easily measure protein levels, we just measure mRNA levels. But this Nature paper just make that claim, make that belief questionable. And this is a, just a gram, diagram from the paper. We can ignore the details, but basically you can just think about this as the conclusion. It tries to say translation is more important than transcription. Translation has a bigger contribution. By contribution, we mean that this step is more important than this step. So mRNAs are not so meaningful or useful. Why is this so important? Because previously, hundreds of billions of dollars was, were spent on RNA level research. If they're not meaningful, then these money might have been wasted, right? That's a very big loss. But is this really true? I can tell you that this paper had a correction issued two years later because of what I will present next. So my collaborator, Dr. Mark Bigan, who was a biochemist at Berkeley, so he became doubtful of that paper's result. And we were kind of motivated by this famous article, why most published research findings are false. So this article in 2005 questioned the reproducibility of many scientific findings. And a major reason of that is the use or misuse of statistics. So Mark, as a biochemist, he was familiar with the real concentration, I should say levels, of 66 important proteins. So these were measured by previous experiments that were known to be accurate, but they could only measure one protein at a time, as opposed to the mass spectrometry. You just measure all the proteins together. So then, using Mark's knowledge and the old data, we came up with this figure. So the y-axis shows the ratio of the old measure level divided by this nature paper's measure level for every protein. So each dot is one protein. So if the two sets of measurements agree, then each ratio should be close to one. That should be meaning they're equal, right? But we can see that this is roughly the case for the proteins that have a large number of copies, or the, we can say the high level proteins. But for the low level proteins, the ratio is very big much bigger than one. That means the old measurements are bigger than the new measurements, so the ratios are big, which also means that the new measurements in the Nature paper are underestimates. They, they estimate the protein levels to be too low. That's the bias we want to correct first. Second, we must bear in mind that the new measurements in the Nature paper are not perfectly accurate. So here, Shows we showed the every gene. This is the protein level measured in replicate one, replicate two, meaning that the scientists in the Nature paper did the protein measurements, mass spectrometry for twice. And so every gene can have two measurements in the two replicates. So if we compare the measurements, we can see that they are roughly on the diagonal line, meaning that they are roughly agreeing with each other. But again, for the low level proteins, there's a bigger difference between the two measurements. So these are what we call measurement noise. We want to account for that in the final calculation. And also, at the RNA level, the Nature paper uses RNA-seq, but RNA-seq is known to be less accurate than another technology in the x-axis. So we can see that here they are not perfect agreeing with each other. Therefore, RNA-seq also has measurement noise to be accounted for. 
So accounting for both the bias and noise in the data in the Nature paper, our conclusion becomes slightly different. So the recalculation we did shows that we cannot simply claim translation dominates. Instead, we think transcription is still likely playing a bigger role. And that's what we reported in this Science Perspective article. That is, transcriptional control still, we think, makes the larger contribution. So we reestablished the belief that measuring RNA levels is meaningful. And the previous research findings are still valuable. Besides, we take another approach look at, to look at the data. So to know that this nature paper, how they measure translation, is not done by experiments, but by their computation calculation. So in other words, they didn't measure translation, but they tried to compute translation using a model. Then we can see that compared to some other data we collected, the red, the green and the blue curves, these are from real data that measure translation, how fast translation happens. Compared to the Nature Paper's computation result, they are, they are obviously different. And you can see a bigger, wider spread in the Nature Paper's rates, meaning that it's not accurate, right? So this kind of inaccuracy would also affect their conclusion. So if we change the data to the data that use experimental measurements, we see another different conclusion. And in this conclusion, again, we show that transcription plays a bigger role than translation. So we use two different approaches to reach the same conclusion by reanalyzing the Nature Papers data. Because of the importance of this finding, people care about central dogma and whether RNA levels are meaningful. Our findings was included in this undergraduate textbook for biology major students. So I want to say that my educational goal, my group junction of statistics and biology, now you can see the meaning of the colors, blue for statistics, um, green for biology, purple for junction, I want to educate my students to be the next generation scientists who know statistics, including the theory, so they can know how to design better methods, and also the practical skills, data analysis, computer programming. And they also need to know biology, so they know which scientific questions are important. They need to have the basics of molecular biology, genetics, and also to understand what we mean by transcriptomics, right, the collection of RNAs, what we mean by gene regulation, how different genes give us different RNA levels, and also the cutting edge genomics technologies, how the data are generated. Together, my group, Junction of Statistics and Biology, JSB, will focus on enhancing the statistical rigor in biomedical data analysis. So leveraging this rigor, we hope to develop new powerful methods for analyzing the data generated by new technologies. So hopefully we can make important discoveries from data. And an exciting part of this field is that a lot of the data are publicly available, so we could access those data and make our own discoveries. So finally, I want to conclude my talk by returning to this song. Let's listen to the last piece of it. Oh, but I just want to say that this is a term coined by the singer Li Hong Wang. Why is it called Qing Dao? Right? At first glance, you may think, hmm, this has a bad connotation. And it was called this by purpose. As I mentioned earlier, Li Hong was born in the U.S., grew up in the U.S., in Rochester, New York. So when he was little, he was caught this term chink. And when he became a musician, he wanted to add a past tense to this word, chinked, which means that it's the past, and out means it's gone. So that's the music style. And he wants to use the Chinese ingredients to emphasize his identity while leveraging his training in Western music. So one thing I want to mention is that this song was written using the music term called polyphony, which means there has multiple tracks that have different melodies, but they can mix into this nice sound. So this is an example of one plus one greater than two, which is what I want to achieve with my research. 
So finally, I have many people to thank, especially the people who helped me prepare the slides. First, the term, or the, my group name, Junction of Statistics and Biology, was created thanks to my friend Xin Tong, who is a professor in University of Southern California and my collaborator. So the reason we think we thought about this group name was because I didn't want to call my group Lab, right? And my last name is so common, and that doesn't give me any uniqueness. That's the first reason. And I think this junction is really what my research aims to achieve. And also I want to thank my friend and also collaborator, Wei Li, who is, a club, who is a professor at UC Irvine, for giving me this idea to add music. Otherwise, I wouldn't do this anyway. This is the first time ever I have done this. And also my friend, Chen Lu, who is in the audience, and my remote friend, Chong Zhi Zhang, and also my student, Guang Yan for helping me refine the slides. They give me a lot of very detailed comments. And also Cashew, the fellow here, who helped me rehearse this talk and who told me the term melisma, which is about how the tone can change in R&B and Chinese opera. And also, of course, my students for research. And I, I think on the scene, a nice coincidence is that today is called the, Nas the International Women's Day because it's the March the 8th. Because Radcliffe was a Radcliffe College, women's college, and I'm a fellow in the program. And I think it's, wow, what a surprise coincidence that my talk is on this day. So finally, I want to also <laughs> especially thank Claudia and Jane for their help with this talk. And I want, to, I want people to see that statistics something useful and exciting. So thank you all for your attention. Wow, thank you, Jessica. I can only imagine how hard it was to like put everything in in a, in a format that we could all understand, right? So thank you. sometimes it's really thank you challenging. So thank you very much for the talk and for that specifically. So uh, we do have a few questions, but please do feel free to ask more. We do have some time. Okay, the first question is, do you think that the current technologies are more likely to pick up true biological signal or noise within complex biological systems? Fantastic question. I want to say it's a mix. And once we develop a new technology, it's like a new exploration. Just think about when people build those ships so they can sail to different places in the world, right? Do we know whether we can find new treasure or is it danger? I think mm -hmm. that's very similar to the tech, new technologies. But at least they give us new information we can explore. Since I think one thing I have to mention is that the melisma, right, the music, both R&B and Chinese opera use melisma. What's common between biology and statistics? I think it's noise. So statistics mm -hmm. is a discipline that really studies data by considering noise. And biological data are noise, as you said, especially with new technology. There's often a trade-off. The more you measure, the less accurate everything you measure. So how do we balance the trade-off? I think these are the challenges we want to address. But I'm optimistic. I think given those new data, we should be able to find new information. But we just have to do it in a careful way, yeah, so we can make sure the findings are real. What is, what is it exactly that some scientists miss about statistics, and why do so many errors go unnoticed? Wow, that's a, another great question. I have to say, as I mentioned earlier, statistics is a very specialized field, right? Just like Chinese opera. Not so many people can sing it well. You have to go through many years of training mm -hmm. to really master the skills. Same for statistics. I think the biggest challenge is that our education is still quite limited, and we don't have a big enough talent pool of people who want to study statistics. 
So that's why I hope the field can become more diverse. We can have more talented people join us, more people understand statistics, especially scientists who generate and need to analyze data. That's the only way I can see to make our data analysis more rigorous and to make the scientific discoveries more rigorous, more reproducible. Yeah, following on, on that thread of, uh, about education, uh, yeah. one listener asked, how should computation be taught in statistics versus biology? Very good question. I have to admit, I don't have a very good answer right now, but what I want to say is that I hope computation can be taught in a more intuitive way, again, to attract more people to learn. And I think we are moving in that direction. So now I think the coding, right, programming, I should say it's easier than before because we have a lot of online good tutorials to give us guidance. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I have to say that I learned a lot from preparing this talk, like how to edit music videos, because I tried to piece the music video and the English <laughs> lyrics into one video. I learned that, and I also learned how to use Photoshop to change the color of some figures to make the color theme consistent. And these are all thanks to Google. I searched for the articles. Same for programming. But regarding the question, difference between biology and teaching computation in biology and statistics, I think that's what my book aimed to do. I think the teaching should be in the context. Like if you teach biologists, biology students to do programming, use the data and examples they're familiar with. Mm -hmm. Then they will be more motivated to learn, right, and find the relevance. And following up on that, mm -hmm. how has your cross-disciplinary training and research shaped the way you teach math and science in mm. college courses? So how mm -hmm. have you applied your experience yes. as a biologic, uh, yeah. biologist and statistician? That, I think that's very helpful. My experience made me, maybe I can talk to more people mm -hmm. and understand what the common confusions might be and try to give them more intuitive examples than using jargon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I hoped, yeah. But I think knowing more people, especially like this fellowship, right? I think the reason why I was interested in the first place was because as you can see, I have broad interests. I think that's part of my nature. I think I enjoy talking to people from different backgrounds so I can maybe see the bigger picture of my research so I can put it in a bigger context to convince people this is something important. And mm -hmm. I think teaching as well. I think if, we want, if I can convince my college students this is something useful and potentially important, then the students may be willingness to bear some of the TD things, tedious things in the material, like statistics, mm -hmm. right? And bear that and try to understand it and then find, oh, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can you give us, uh, so, you know, we've listened to your talk, but at the beginning you said that, you know, for statisticians, uh, the quote said, it's like playing in someone else's backyard. Yeah. So can you give us a couple of examples of how you played in some biologist's backyard? You know, just some interesting research that you've some done interesting in that area. Thing. Yeah, one recent interesting, I think is really interesting, is that Many biologists, because you know, people have different expertise, right? When they want to analyze their data, they have to follow or use some popular computational software packages available to analyze their data. But our recent article published last year, we found that we have to check if those tools are suitable for your data. If you don't do the check, the results may be totally off mm -hmm. because they may not be okay or suitable for your data, they're defined, they're designed, the methods were developed, designed based on some uh, assumptions the biologists are not aware of, but they just use the popular things, right? Follow the popularity. That's easy, reasonable, but can be dangerous. So we, we, our current focus is that we really want to offer some easy to use sanity check tools so biologists can check before they use popular method and they can realize, yes, if the results are not making sense, I shouldn't trust the results. I think that's one way we play in biologists' backyard, besides what mm. I talked about. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so the next question, we couldn't avoid COVID-19, of course. Has mm. COVID-19 research impacted or influenced your own research findings? Oh, very good question. I have to say COVID-19 was really tough for experimental scientists, right? Mm -hmm. Because during the lockdown, they couldn't access the lab experiments. 
right? They cannot do new experiments. We were lucky. We are, I think we were the most lucky people during the pandemic because we were computational people. We can work at home, we can work on our computers. For me, what COVID-19 has helped my research is that I had more time to think because I didn't travel. I saved a lot of commuting time. So we had to think about many questions we wouldn't have thought if we were not having so much time. And but I have to say that we didn't delve into COVID-19 research because I didn't think that was our expertise. And there are a lot more experts who work on this. So we didn't work on COVID-19 per se, but I want to say that COVID-19 made people aware the importance of public health mm -hmm. and how we can do better, right? To cure the disease or to prevent the disease from happening again. I think these all call for the attention mm -hmm. to pay to the importance of biomedical research. Yeah. Let's move on to um, your experience and um, interactions with other disciplines. So how do you see statistics, statistics interacting with the humanities? Mm -hmm. For example, how can bioinformatics and computational and computation be useful in better doing historical and literary research? Very interesting point. Yeah, I would say statistics point. is very important for humanities and social science because what is statistics? It's about seeing the data. We want to infer the truth, right? Underline mm -hmm. truth, what's really happening. For social science, humanities, we don't have as many measurements as in natural sciences like biology. Then how to do statistics correctly is more important, especially some of the results will have social, political, policy implications. So one thing I think which is currently very popular in economics is, is called causal inference. Mm -hmm. People want to draw potentially causal conclusions from data that are not from experiments, right? They are observational data. How can you analyze those data? It's, it's tough and, and it's tricky, but I think it's something people want to do. And regarding the what the, it's about the, the bioinformatics, right? I think bioinformatics is more specific to the data types I talk about, but it can be interpreted in a broader sense. So in other words, if we really think, yes, this humanities problems involves genomics data, for example, maybe privacy, genom genome privacy issue. That's something computational people should consider. On the one hand, we want to collect more data. On the other hand, how can we protect the donor's privacy? That's a very challenging issue, right? And we have to be very careful. careful. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. So you say that uh, there's vast genomics data awaiting analysis. Mm -hmm. What does it mean in science when the quantity of available data far exceeds human capacity to engage with them? Mm. Wow. Well, yeah. Challenging question, very challenging question. I have to say we need collective efforts, like we need people who are really good at computation, computer scientists, right, who knows how to efficiently store data so we can store the data, right? Mm -hmm. How can we can efficiently access the data if given the limit of our internet bandwidth? Those are all computer science questions. Given that, how can we extract valuable information from vast of data because it's not maybe not all the data are meaningful then how can we extract the key information i think that needs statistics how can we summarize our data into some meaningful numbers and we can continue from there mm -hmm. so probably that can largely reduce the data size because we are only keeping the meaningful part so i think these are these all call for long-term efforts yeah, yeah and new technologies possibly yeah um so you mentioned precision medicine. Yeah. Can you talk about how, I mean, you've, you've said in how your research is going to impact it, mm. but how do you see it going? I mean, are we ever mm. get to personalized, Medi individualized treatments? Yeah. I know it's not, a, not yeah. um, an imminent yeah. event, but what's your... Mm -hmm. description of the landscape as it is? Yeah, I think we are trying to get closer there, mm -hmm. especially if we want to really do diagnosis on an individual basis and also not be too invasive. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of efforts are putting into how can we do diagnosis from blood, 
because joint blood is the easiest way, right? Mm -hmm. But blood, what can they provide you? Because if your disease is in the liver, in the brain, it, the, like I said, brain and liver cells have very different RNAs and proteins from blood cells, right? So what can blood cells tell us? Only DNA. So therefore, a lot of efforts, especially those based on large population size data, are focusing on DNA. So hopefully we can still use DNA to give us some valuable information so we can make the treatment more precise. I think we are making some very solid progress for certain disease, mm -hmm. but of course, only a small proportion of it. But still, it's better, right? So we are still making solid progress. So I have to say I am optimistic. That's why I chose to work in this area. And one final question. So um, it's about the Radcliffe Fellowship, so I'll, I'll read it out. So yeah. can you tell us a bit more about how the Radcliffe Fellowship and the interaction with people who work in different disciplines mm. have impacted your research this far? Very good question. I honestly have to say it made me think bigger out mm -hmm. of my research domain, right? So that's why I could draw, <laughs> I think, quite interesting connections from other things like music and also social impact, right, and diversity. I think those are all the things I learned from the fellowship. To put myself more like a citizen in the society rather than a scientist in a protected environment so I can do my research, not worry about other things. But I think mm -hmm. this fellowship made me see the bigger society and the topics that other people are caring about. Mm -hmm. I think that can make me better position my research and think about what its real impact. Why do I need to spend my efforts on this? How it can be beneficial in the long term, not just in the short term. I think that's the most important impact. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank oh, you for yeah. your presentation and Thank for you. answering our questions. It's my pleasure. Thank you to our audience here in the room and online. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your questions. Uh, I hope you'll be able to join us for other Radcliffe, Radcliffe events. You can find out about them on at harvard.radcliffe.edu where you can also see videos of past events. And with that, thank you very much for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you.